Today, you'll hear how a winemaker went from Australia to Burgundy to Oregon, back to Australia, before landing in New Zealand at a winery with a 1,000-year plan. This is the Inside Wine Podcast. I'm Joe Janish, a wine industry professional since 1996, giving you insider tips to make the right wine decisions. As the Senior Director of Public Relations for Cobrin, I'm lucky enough to meet and speak with many people in the world of wine. And today, I had the chance to talk to globetrotting winemaker Julian Grounds of Craggy Range. Craggy Range is one of New Zealand's top wine producers with vineyards in Hawke's Bay and Martinborough. And they're known primarily for outstanding Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc, as well as for two Bordeaux blends called Tecahu and Sophia. And they arguably make the best Syrah made in New Zealand, Les Sol. If you know New Zealand for inexpensive Sauvignon Blanc, you may not be too familiar with Craggy Range. Because while the winery does make Sauvignon Blanc, it retails for $22, which isn't exactly inexpensive for most people. Now believe me, it's worth every penny. And what you're going to learn from today's conversation with their winemaker, Julian Grounds, is that Craggy Range has as much, if not more, focus on red wines as it does with their whites. And just to let you know, this conversation gets a little geeky. So if you're more of a neophyte, you may find some of this information a little over your head. But hang in there. You'll learn a few things that'll help you understand how high quality wines are made, as well as a few concepts that will impress your friends. Without further ado, here's the conversation with Julian Grounds. Maybe you could start off, Julian, by just telling us a little bit about how you got into winemaking, because it sounds like that's what you've been doing your whole life. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, um, which it's now actually getting to the point where it feels like it's a a decent level of experience as opposed to always being the the youngest in the pack. So um, I actually studied it uh, straight out of school in uh, Western Australia. So I was I I was seventeen actually when I started doing winemaking at university. Um, turned eighteen that year, so I had a family that came from a farming past, um, a, a more kind of wheat and grain farming. But we always had friends that had old vines around, um, just because that's the nature of when you farm. There's always someone that wants to to make some wine in the back of the shed. So um, you know, I, I was probably trying to figure out what I wanted to do long term when I was at school. Uh, but I always had a firm kind of understanding about chemistry and also I had a slightly kind of creative edge from from my family as well. So maybe maybe at the time I was thinking that winemaking might be something that I would do for the short term and figure out what I wanted to do when I got serious about life. But it just happened that uh, when I got into study, uh, you know, I realized it was a really – probably layered um, lifestyle and, and work career and, and fortunate enough to do very well when I was at university and go and do a bit more study and work in Pui Fusay at the age of 20. And I think from then on, it was kind of a clear path for me. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you wound up in, how did you wind up in Burgundy? Yeah. So, so um, like I said, I was fortunate enough at the time, I was actually working for uh, Lewin Estate in Margaret River, who, um, uh, for those of you aware, you know, probably one of Australia's most iconic Chardonnays for quite a while now. Um, and they had such a Chardonnay focus, they were really keen to send me to Burgundy. Um, we had a a kind of friend of ours that was in Pui Fusay. I didn't really know much about the region and they, they sent me there and there was a local école to do a bit more study while I was there as well. But I, I would say it was a really formative experience for me because, you know, the Cote d'Or and the, um, is, is amazing and, and, and extremely extravagant and iconic um, wines. And uh, out at Pui Fusay, it was a lot more rusticity about how we were going about things. There was no English spoken and um, you know, the vines themselves, if you look at the vineyards, really undulating when compared to the, you know, the gentle slopes of the Cote d'Or. So it probably, it probably made me grow up a lot as an individual, but also to see, see those wines that uh, vineyards never heard of. And I think now you see that the prices of Pui Fusay have really climbed, which is a testament to the, the quality of the region. Yeah. Amazing wines. Yeah. And, and value, you know, and even looking at Macon, you know, Macon's maybe not the most idyllic place in the world, but some great varietal wines, you know, beautiful wines. And there's, you know, Alagote and things like that coming out of there as well. So it was all just really good in, uh, I suppose, opening my eyes up to what was out there. All right. And then somehow you wound up in the Northwest United States. Yeah. So I, I had, I'd really decided probably from that trip and onwards that Pinot Noir was going to be um, a really key part of my learnings. Unfortunately, Western Australia is 
due to the maritime nature of it and its latitude, it's on the 36th parallel. It's not as conducive to growing high quality Pinot Noir. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to have a mentor at the time who had worked in Oregon and told me about the the quality of the wines there. So um, by nature of a vintage in New Zealand on the way to working to Oregon, I met my now wife, uh, who was Wonderful. also yeah, so who was living in Portland originally from Alaska, and um, I wound up working for the Ponzi family actually, working for Louisa Ponzi, who um, for those you aware, you know, found one of the inaugural founding four families of of the Willamette Valley, and um, I, I mean. Louisa is uh, trained in Burgundy and has such a um, such a French way of going about the way she makes Pinot Noir. I think at the time we were doing probably close to a hundred different Pinot Noir ferments. You know, average size at about one point five ton each. You know, from five single vineyards, and I just learnt so much about clones, about aspect, about massage selection that it really um, it really set me on a path to to kind of making high quality Pinot Noir. Wow. So at this point, had you decided you were going to be a Pinot Noir specialist or like, did you fall in love with the grape? I would say that I'd worked out I was going to be a cool climate specialist at this stage. So, and I'd, I'd really had developed a, um, and, and I'm fortunate enough to kind of um, gone down the, the fine wine path. You know, I mean, the reality is, is that Australia has amazing fine wine, but it also has a lot of, you know, commercial wine as well. And, and a lot of those jobs are the ones that might be easier to get. So I went for the less lucrative path, but um, I I just knew that it was that it was single sites, cool climate wines is what motivated me. And, you know, the Margaret River had tr- turned to me about Chardonnay and, and fortunate enough, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir generally go hand in hand. I'd also been fortunate enough to have some, you know, Bordeaux training at Margaret River as well, you oh, know, where, they, where yeah. they grow a lot of Cabernet sure. and, and friends. So sure. Um, but I, yeah, at that stage, it was definitely that I could see myself making um, single vineyard wines that were um, uh, that were you know from predominantly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and then more wood to follow when I went to the Yarra Valley. All right. Yeah. And now, so you start in Australia. If you yeah. go to Burgundy, yeah. Then you go to the Northwest United States, yeah. And now you find yourself back. And the Southern Hemisphere again? Yeah, so so um, I suppose the 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 problem uh, that uh, that got in the way eventually um, was there was you know it was hard to stay in the states long term, um, whether it be for visa issues or what have you. So um, Sarah and I, my now wife, we we kind of decided that we would we would go back to Australia for a stint. I'd okay. been going back there to do vintages with friends for for the whole time I was overseas. So um, I was really fortunate enough to to kind of be connected to um, a man by the name of Steve Flamsteed, who's the chief winemaker of Giant Steps, who, I mean, within the Australian um, kind of fraternity, is probably one of the most respected winemakers sure. um, and comes from a single vac- big, single vineyard background himself. Um, he actually trained in Beaujolais, um, but more on kind of crew Beaujolais. Oh, wow. um, so, yeah, I found myself in the Yarra Valley, which at the time was going through a really boom in um, in creativity and, and expo- exploration of sites. And and that's where I kind of got into Syrah as well because we were doing a lot of single vineyard Syrah. So okay. um, to kind of round out the craggy varietals, that we, we kind of got to Syrah, Pinot and Chardonnay there. So it was such an integral um, part of my story was my time at Giant Steps and, um, you know, probably ultimately led to me to to Craggy Range and and the powers that be finding out who I was. Right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Craggy Range for uh, if if our listener doesn't know anything about Craggy Range, could you give us just like the elevator pitch? Yeah, absolutely. So so we're actually coming up to our 20th year um, since we started um, and put vines in the ground in 1999 and and 2000, but 20th year since we released wine. Um, so it's it was founded by the Peabody family. They they originally hail from America, but have been in Queensland for quite a while. So Queensland in the north east of Victoria. They they'd always aspired to to ha- to start a wine business at some stage. It was really important to them. And uh, at the time, they were doing a lot of business with the Rothschild family. Okay. And the Rothschild family had said. Look, if I if we'd had our time, we would have gone into New Zealand in terms of New World wineries, you know, and that's that's where we see a lot of the new great land becoming available. So they ultimately ended up being in contact with Steve Smith, who was an MW viticulturalist at right. the time, the only MW viticulturalist, right. and 
you know, it could have easily been Yarra Valley, it could have easily been Tasmania, it could have been any other region in New Zealand, but it led us to what is the Hawke's Bay region and ultimately the sub-region of the Gimlet Gravels, which for those of you who don't know is is a sub-GI, which is 100% of, a, of one soil type. A gimlet gravels, which as it sounds is is gravels and is very young soil. It's a it's a redistributed kind of river um, riverbed. So there's no soil per se. It's it's gravel. And so the aspirations that led us there was that the family and Steve thought that if they wanted the New Zealand wineries to stand on the world stage and feel confident, there would be a red blend um, that would have a certain notoriety and, and stand up and look at me presence about it. And so they thought that it had to be a Bordeaux blend at the time. Right. And the only place they could see in New Zealand that they would achieve regular ripeness and wines of definition were the Gimlet gravels. And so that led us there and ultimately planting Syrah as well. But at the same time, New Zealand was cre- um, creating a, you know, a fair bit of um, notoriety for Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir, right. which led us to also purchasing and um, planting down in the Martinborough region, which is down near Wellington, and so both on the North Island. So we we kind of established ourselves in two um, distinct regions, and from then on, it was kind of um, very much of you know a, a world class take on how we went about things so we were commercially we were close planted which was you know really unheard of in 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 the new world really to be as close planted as we were um we had this amazing winery that was helped design by the late Doug Weiser who had trained under Ted Lemon at Literai um we had you know the most unique clones you could get and everything was about achieving wines that were of the highest quality obtainable so for those of you you know if you look at the packaging if you look at the quality of wine across every skew we did it was kind of quality first and everything will follow so i think from definitely from my perspective from both australia and new zealand it's probably you know it's unparalleled in its ambition it, it, the the company put is in a thousand year old trust so the family have a thousand year old vision where it can't basically be touched till then. So aspirationally, you know, that's amazing. We're not trying to own a short term gain. It's basically in a thousand years, we'll still be around. And we're hopefully that we're, we're known for, uh, you know, those, you talk about Sasakai just before you look at the generations of these wineries. I mean, we've got a lot of time to, to oh catch up to those. Yeah. A, th- a thousand years. That's a, that's a long term plan. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and I mean, obviously it's going to be generations and generations of, of family, um, after then but i think that just you know it's 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 a really important thing because everything we do we we look at long-term planning you know it's not none of this if we're going to pull something out clone wise because it hasn't worked it's like well look, will that help us help us make better wine into the future if there's a new variety that might have become available or a new clone that's become available again it's not nothing can be for a short-term gain it can't just because there's a trend that's happening right now it has to be will that help us make better quality wine do these soils do this climate allow that expression of that quality of wine if they don't then it won't occur wow so Mm -hmm. with all that long-term planning and and vision do you have like do you have like vineyards that are more experimental like where you're trying to yeah i mean try things and yeah if i if i could say that like you know for the gimlet gravels i think since we started we've actually we've probably turned over 30 percent of the planting material already and that's not because we don't like sitting on our hands it's just more that hey maybe we got the clones wrong or i mean generally what's actually happening is on the gravels while it is it is all gravel. We're finding parts which are siltier, that, which might be more suited to Chardonnay. Mm-hmm. And what we might have had, say, Merlot or Syrah planted. We're pulling that out. And equally on some of the bonier, when I say bony, I mean very high gravel content, we might have had some Chardonnay there and we're going to pull that Chardonnay out and we're going to put Syrah. And then also, you know, we've found out that from our own Marseille selection on Syrah that that is our preferred clone. So we're gradually replacing that. So experimental-wise, 100%. There's been some varieties that we've had that we, we don't think that have worked. And if varieties become came more suited to climate if it if the climate was to change that's something that we'd entertain but it can't just be for you know a, a short five years of high accelerated sales it has to be because it's going to go into a craggy range bottle and we're, we're, going to, we're going to feel confident that that's the best expression we can make from new zealand wow so mm-hmm. now that you've been at um craggy range for a little while you've also had time in Burgundy, you've had time in the Northwest United States. What what do you see similar as far as like 
soil, climate? Are there any similarities, contrasts to those two areas? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's extremely unique. It's extremely unique because the land mass of New Zealand is so small that it doesn't really have a moderating effect against the weather. So of all the wine regions in New Zealand, of the major wine regions, there's only one that's not maritime influenced, that being Central Otago, which is more of a high desert. So... You know, if you were to say Burgundy's continental, I think Oregon is both continental and maritime, depending on the, the prevailing weather patterns. We are we are maritime influence, so we are we are a hundred percent at the mercy of of what happens out in the oceans. But the 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 meaning of that is that we we are a cool climate in its, in its essence. And if I look at the unfortunate effects of climate change on both the regions that you've mentioned, it's probably looking at they're having warmer and drier vintages. Right. And we can't say that about New Zealand. We're we're experiencing, you know, if we look at the long term averages, it's it's hard to pinpoint at the moment. I think we'll probably get more. Um, up and down weather events, but it's not, it's not, you know, picking data is not coming forward. So very fortunate because that to me gives us conviction that we have got the right things planted. Um, and now we're experiencing vine age, you know, after 15 years, I really do think that you get the, the effects of vine age, you know, up to a hundred years, maybe. So other similarities, I mean, in terms of soil types, probably more with Burgundy than then Oregon, you know, Oregon is definitely volcanic derived and we are volcanic, volcanic derived, but our soils are extremely younger than both those two regions. So we haven't really had the stratification of the soils yet. So it's very raw in its essence. So down in Martinborough where we have Pinot, we have limestone. Up in the Gimlet Gravels where we have Syrah and Bordeaux varietals, we have more of a sandstone. But, you know, and that's, that's kind of very well suited to those varietals that we've, we've planted. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like... You you said you're at the mercy of of the oceans. Yeah. Do, do you find? Well, you've only been here for a little while, but do, from the experience and the history that you know, is it um, challenging from year to year? To like, what are the different challenges that you see? Yeah. Like, I, is it more at the beginning of the year, the end of the year, harvest? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like, unfortunately, I haven't worked out how to control right. the weather yet. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got to get on that. Come yeah, on. yeah, I got to get on that. So, <laughs> so definitely, um, you know. The great thing about being cool climate is you're getting cool winters. Okay. The flip side of that is, um, as we see in Burgundy and and we experienced this year as well, is we're going to have frost events during the spring. So frost fighting is always a um, is a really interesting thing for us to a challenge for us. To, I would say um, before I flew out here, we'd had five frost events already. Oh, um, no damages yet, which is fantastic. But you know that's something that we have to be on top of, and we we generally use we're, we're allowed to use frost fans in New Zealand, but we also we we can use spr- um, sprinklers and also helicopters if we need to. So um, and and that's something that we would definitely um, use if we had to because we all know the devastating effects of frost. So frost would be the first main concern. After that, it's really um, high kind of rainfall events. And they can happen really at the start of the growing season, which is not a problem. But they could also happen at the end of the growing season. And that's usually when they're remnants of cyclone events. So we don't get the high winds, but we can get, um, you know, maybe eight to 10 inches of rain in 24 hours. Oh. Yeah. So that's not something that's great for anything Mm -hmm. um, and the humidity that's associated with that. What we would like to believe is that, at least on the gravels, um, where, those, where the weather is usually swinging, so the east coast of New Zealand, that's where they, went, they come out of the Pacific. But we'd like to imagine that, at least with Syrah and Merlot, we've generally harvested those varieties, and that's why we went Merlot heavy. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon is definitely probably the more of the dangerous, but as, they, as you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, thick skin variety, yeah. it's generally able to see out those events. So it's nothing that we would experience that I would say that uh, we shouldn't be planted where we are, but that said, it's something that most people are aware of. And, and to negate that, you know, we definitely maintain open canopies. We do a lot, a high degree of kind of manipulation of shoots and leaves by hand. We also... We also know who we are and we are still cool climate. So we, we maintain extremely low crops. So, you know, for some of those prestige varieties of La Sol and Sophia, so our Syrah and Merlot blends, it might be 1.5 tonne to the acre, you know, as oh. low as that. So um, that's, and that means that we're going to be able to achieve ripeness and we're going to get the flavor concentration that we need. Okay. Yeah. So previously you mentioned Steve Smith, MW, who was a legendary winemaker. Mm. So he was there at, craggy range from the beginning and then later his protege matt stafford and now you're walking in following in the footsteps of some pretty big legendary figures what is it that you will be doing to kind of like put your spin on 
the wines or make your mark with craggy range while still maintaining the same style and character like what what kinds of things will you be doing yeah and i think it's a really interesting thing it must it must be the the same um kind of um thought process for multi-generational businesses you know when the when the son or daughter take over from from their predecessor you know, the most important thing is brand and site, you know, and that's what Craggy Range has, has chosen the right sites, the right varieties, and we, we've been able to, um, you know, build up a really strong brand that people trust. So I'd never do anything that is going to, you know, detract from that. And I want to make – the reason I wanted to come to Craggy Range when, they, when I was fortunate enough to be approached is that uh, I remember changing – Trying La Sol when I was younger, and it's such a wine of unique sight. I mean, La Sol can only come from one place, and that's on Hawke's Bay in New Zealand. It can't come from the Hunter Valley or the Barossa. It can't come from Cote Rote or San Joseph. It can only come from Hawke's Bay. So that's a really, you know, unique and, and motivating thing for me. I would say that uh, having experience with you know, multiple single vineyard sites and and the intricacies that exist within that site. So I'm really keen to explore the sub terroirs that go within our with our site. But also, you know, maybe I with Syrah and Pinot in particular, um, I've got vast experience with whole cluster. We've now got mature vines. You know, with young vines, you can't use whole cluster because the bun- bunch architecture is wrong. I feel like we're probably going to see the the use of stem a bit more but at least in araha and la sol and that that to me is because when we have these warmer vintages uh with the use of stem we're going to create the the beautiful balance of freshness and excitement but also the the kind of elevated peaks that we achieve with the wines when they age is for me always been higher in whole bunch wines you know not to to compare ourselves but there's no Romani Conti and Jamais, you look at both those wines as, as epitomes of their varietal, but they, they don't talk about what why they use stem. It's just what they do, you know, and maybe that's something that we're beginning to explore a bit more as well. I definitely know in 19, it's probably a very iconic vintage for Craggy Range. My first vintage there as well. I was very fortunate to have beautiful, warm, dry summer. The whole bunch of wines look fantastic because they have so much elevated perfume and they have beautiful structure. And for for me, that's something that's really akin to New Zealand wines. And maybe that's because we have these younger soils as well, is that we've got great structure in those wines. And whole bunch of wines can be that that beautiful structure, but also perfume. So I think it's more I'm fortunate enough to inherit vineyards with now becoming older vines and I would like to imagine that we're going to continually push ourselves to evolve those wine styles. The other thing that we're seeing more and more is you know, we just started to trial organics as well and we're, and we're looking at maybe doing some even high-density plantings into the future as well, even narrower spacing. And that's because we're only now are we, as in the new world, You know, we, I think for so long there was a focus on winemaking. Now we're looking at uh, you know, the, what is the – there's so much to learn from whether it be – the new new pruning methods, um, Pusak and Guyard kind of pruning methods, or whether it be um, vine training, or whether it be planting density, or whether it be manipulation at specific times. These are all things that people are only learning now. You know, right? Yeah. 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 So it's really shifting from the from the cellar to the, the viticulture and the the land more. Yeah, and, and and I think that anyone in the old world would say, well, that's the way it's always been, you know, and and, and that's and I and I don't get me wrong, like you know, we had a viticultural um, MW that we started with, so we were fortunate enough there. But I also think that um, a lot of the glamour has always gone to the winery, mm-hmm. and, and that's um, and that's something that. It was just, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, it's probably just, you know, the nature of the beast. And now we're really saying that, yes, winemaking is so important to to kind of – you still have to reflect the site and someone ultimately has to has to put their, their self on the line and say, that is my interpretation of that site. But that site and what, it, what the, you know, the raw material can give you, we can continue to evolve that. You know, we we have the right things planted. We realise that we have the right sites. We've we are we are categorically believe that we have the best sites for our varieties. So now we have to see what is what is how can we get that raw material improved? You know, whether it be for mass sale selection, looking more and more at that um, on some of our best blocks, whether it be from planting density. You know, and it might not be. We might do experiments and it might be a failure. But if we don't go there, we we'll never know. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you're mentioning how the you feel like you have the best sites. And toward that end, a lot of people who aren't all that familiar with New Zealand wine, they may pick up a bottle and they expect to see Marlboro. Yeah. But it says Martinboro. Yeah. So they're like, is that is that like a... Is it a, a spelling, spelling mistake? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. maybe you could walk us through why Martinborough as opposed to Marlboro or anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. So so Martinborough for Sauvignon Blanc was a really um, thought out um, plan for us. You know, we we traced some great wines from some wineries down there from Sauvignon Blanc wines, and what we loved about those wines was the minerality that they had. So Sauvignon Blanc, um, for those of you aware, you know, Marlboro always has quite obvious kind of cut grass but also passion fruit kind of esters it's that really um kind of obvious uh, varietal characteristic i suppose and we felt that craggy range wines you know that the greatest expression and enjoyment of those wines would be in a restaurant scene so you need to have wines that are conducive with food consumption so for us in sauvignon blanc yes we want to have those varietal characteristics but it's very important to have a a balance of savory slash minerality edge and what we saw off martin Brew is because we had cooler region we had more kind of limestone base less of those heavy soils which are associated with all those esters we were going to craft lower yield of wines and that's always been a key of what we do so for sauvignon blanc we're not as low as we are for reds but we are still low for for commercial aspects uh the vines have more open canopy so we get more light in there so we get less again less of that shady kind of thyle uh, and then we got more minerality. And I think if you try the wines for us, you definitely see people go, oh, that's that's not what I expected of Sauvignon Blanc, but they're really, that's a positive for them. And and, that, and that's what's something that we're super proud of. O- also on that site, we went for lots of different clones and aspects. So we I made this year for Sauvignon Blanc, so I made 25 different wines to make up the one. Oh, wow. And so there's a lot of diversity within that. And you can mm. imagine some have more of the high acidity, some have more of that kind of fruit core. And that's really when it comes to the point of assemblage, I can create a wine that that expresses, you know, not only minerality and, and beautiful um, acid lime, but has that enjoyment of fruit. Ultimately, it has to be a great drink. And that's sure. what we're trying to do. Right. Yeah. It sounds almost like... Um Martinborough might be a place similar to maybe the Loire Valley. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, I, like, I wouldn't. As far I'll, as the character, the wine, yeah, at least. for sure. Yeah, I, I think that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is so unique. You, you know, yes. it, it really is. And 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 uh, tasting our Martinborough wine, if people had never tried Marlborough wine in their in their in their life, they would still think that that's very expressive. It, it really is, and that's because it is cooler and it it has got lots of UV sunlight. So we're always going to get high high tone fruit, but it is it is definitely for Martinborough, I think that it there is maybe a slightly more old world edge to it. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Mm. Um so 2019 was your first harvest at Craggy Range, correct? Yes. Yeah. So how did it go? Uh yeah, I mean I so I did something right to somewhere <laughs> along the path, I think. I mean, um yeah, it was a blessed vintage to be fair. There's a lot of people that have been in Hawke's Bay a lot longer than me that are saying that it's probably one of the greatest vintages. Oh wow. Yeah. So so on a modern incarnation. So if we look at Hawke's Bay kind of uh Good timing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully um I, Don't screw it up. I know I was gonna say the second vintage has to be as good now. So yeah, that's the pressure's problem. up, yeah. Right. So we, 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 we look at um, Hawke's Bay, uh, you know, since the modern modern incarnation, since the late 80s, it's one of the better finishes conditions. And be, that's because we had lots of rainfall up until Christmas. I remember opposite times of year. So, sure. so early in our growing season, then during, um, then during the kind of uh, – Verizon period where you want an element of water stress, it went completely dry. So we got we got good good fruit number, but then we had small berries, which is beautiful for reds. Great. So we got really high skin to juice ratio. Then no disease pressure, which there's always an element of high humidity in Hawke's Bay, so no disease pressure. So we could pick when we wanted. So it was just a um, yeah, it was probably the greatest vintage I've ever done in my life, um, to be fair. I had a great one in 2010 in, in Oregon that I remember quite uh, – sorry, 2010 in Central Otago and a, and a 2008 vintage Oregon, 2009 in Burgundy. I've had some great vintages as well, but um, it was one of those ones where probably from a personal significance combined with the climatic conditions it will, will always be um, probably the fondest memory of my life, yeah. Maybe you're the good luck charm. Yeah, you can, you can <laughs> tell the owners that. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> 
absolutely. Yeah. So uh, definitely high quality. How's is the volume? good too or is it yeah i mean definitely for sauvignon it was great volume because we had good flowering conditions and that's that doesn't happen either you don't often get that combination of um good volume and and high quality so um yeah we we made hay it was beautiful that's great good Mm. well good for you yeah um so i was going through your through your bio and there's a quote in there about how you say great wines are great stories so did you actually say that? Or yeah, that I'm sure I some, did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or was it some PR guy yeah, writing it for yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's just say, um, what wine would would you say? I know you've only been at Craggy Range for a little while now, but what wine do you think tells the greatest story of Craggy Range? Yeah, I mean, I would actually say two wines. I'd say Sophia and La Soul. Um, Sophia, because it was the motivation for what created the business. You know, we wanted to make a Bordeaux blend and and I try that wine and, and it really, it does have so much of our history into it. It's it's Merlot base, which is perfectly suited there. But, you know, that's a, it's a really, it's a really big gamble for the family to, to put so much investment into a wine that most people would say is marginal. You know, most people would go, oh, if you want to get a sure bet go for a Pinot in New Zealand. But the the benefit of that now is that the spine almost stands alone in New Zealand. It also gets made in its own little winery, so it, it gets, you know, a lot of uh, detail, love and attention. The second being La Soul, only because whilst it wasn't the the initial ethos behind us, it quickly became apparent that it was very well suited to to Hawke's Bay. And I think that, uh, that La Soul... I'm I'm very happy for people to pull a cork on that anywhere in the world and talk to it from a world style. style. I think it's a legitimate category. That, you know, the whole planting of New Zealand Syrah is nothing. You know, it's yeah, right. it's not many hectares at all. Yeah. Um, and to speak volumes of the quality of that wine and and the and the reflection of sight, it's just a really special thing. I think. Yeah. Okay. Mm. What does Julian Grounds like to do when he's not making wine? Yeah. Do I have time outside of wine? So, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't seem like uh, it. Yeah, I got two kids <laughs> two kids under six. So if I'm not if I'm not doing that. No, I mean, um, yeah, I, I unfortunately um have the surfing bug and have my whole life. Oh, so that, uh, yeah, um, right. the, unfortunately because New Zealand has a water temperature akin to that of Alaska. So Ooh. um yeah, so yeah, surfing's always been a huge part of my my story growing up at the beach. Um and you know, like like all great winemakers, I love spending time in the kitchen. So, um, you know, they're probably the two things. New Zealand's also beautiful for, you know, hiking, trail running. It's a, it's a really is. Um, anyone who's seen a movie about it can <laughs> probably imagine what New Zealand looks like. So in terms of uh, taking the family out and camping, a bit of fishing, it's, it's ideal. All right. Yeah. Good. Good yeah. stuff. Thank you so much. Julian Grounds of Craggy Range. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Inside Wine Podcast. Check the show notes for the wines we discussed today and go to insidewinepodcast.com slash one for more information about Julian Grounds, Craggy Range, and New Zealand wine. Please hit the subscribe button so that the next episode is sent to you automagically. And in the meantime, please remember that wine is food. It comes from a place and enjoy it responsibly. Mm-hmm.